I think that was just to say she can hear me. Okay. Um, so then without further ado, I'll pass you over to Gwen. Hello there. Welcome, Falsha. It's uh, actually really nice to be here. And uh, I think that it's a, a really interesting subject. I've done a bit, a bit of research above and beyond, you know, what I kind of already knew about the period. And I think there's some pretty interesting stuff to share tonight. So I hope that you enjoy it. It's absolutely fascinating that we are actually able to find information about the 14th century, which is the period that we're going to be discussing tonight. Basically, the reason I'm choosing to, to look into this period is because it's round about the kind of time scale of, the, of Robert II's life. Robert II um, was the guy who built that castle that you can see uh, in the slide that I've put up first there, uh, Dundonald Castle. <clears throat> he was born around about uh, 1316 and he became King of Scotland in 1371 until 1390. So the whole, basically the whole, almost the whole entire century of the 1300s was based around his life. And, and so what I thought would be interesting to do was, was there any art in that castle that we, that could have been in there, we don't know about? <clears throat> and if there was, what would it have been? So I thought, well, in that case, we should probably have a wee look at what was going on in the kind of general, you know, the world at that time or, and potentially in Scotland. And um, so basically what, what I'm really interested in too is in the history of art, what you're looking at really is how people have evolved uh, uh, and how they've used tools is essentially what we're looking at here. If they've, if they've had um, been particularly interested in metal work, for example, as a, as a culture within a certain art period, then you're going to find some absolutely amazing examples you know, of that or if they're really into painting or pottery or any of the art forms that you that weaving or whatever that you find. And so what you do is you see the progression and that shows you what society's what society's feeling is important for itself at that point. So you're getting a feeling of what the people were like from what they've left behind, I guess, but in the art sense rather than you know in you know everyday objects they've left behind. I also like to look into art history because we, we can also find periods in history where we can get fascinated as an artist, say, on the materials that they used. And you can delve deeper into get a wee sense of the trials that they were in, tri in trials and tribulations and thoughts that they were having. And you can find a creative process. And I suppose all artists do get into a certain level of obsession, but in the best sense of the word, I might add, uh, hopefully, um, because they we, we want to find out more about form, about shape, about colour, about any way we can look at the world through, a, a, you know, basically a hand-rendered pro process. In the medieval times, that's exactly what they did. They didn't have the option to use anything but their own skills. And I, I do hope that in Scotland, we don't know enough about it, that Scotland was actually, they, they really did rate their artists. I do think they did. I think there's always been a culture of that, but we don't know for sure. But as But tonight, as the evening goes on, I hope you'll agree that we're going to find some amazing talent, even if sadly, we might not always know exactly who these artists were. We'll just move on to the next slide. No, not moving on for some reason. Is it not moving? Oh, there we are. Um, so this is basically a little bit about me. Uh, my first connection to working between art and history actually began when I worked at both the Dean Castle and the Dick Institute in Comarnock. And my first job was actually to draw uh, artifacts in their collection. Uh, at that time, it was Comarnock and Loudoun Council. It's now East Ayrshire Council. So they, they brought me in uh, box after box of flint arrowheads, which I had to then look at. And I've, run, I've given a little drawing in the bottom of an example of the kind of things that I would have done, looking at different shapes and been able to differentiate between them. Now, I must admit that was a rather interesting job because a lot of them did look quite alike. But then when you look a bit closer, you do see there was different shapes and I had to register them all and catalogue them. And once they'd finished with those, great lots of boxes then, they brought me things that were a little bit juicier, like uh, medieval helmets and 1,000-year-old Viking swords and things like that to draw. Um, and after all, that was all collect collated and ready for their collection, uh, for the cataloguing. I was then at the Dean Castle in Kilmarnock, inside the Great Hall for roughly about six months. I spent behind a, a great big tapestry banner, and what the job was was to collect was to basically make every single banner for every single member of the family who had lived in Dean Castle. So I was involved. I'm always proud of this one. I was very much involved in the line rampant, 
and also did lots of bits of others. There's two on the screen, which you might not be able to see if you maybe want to move your move the, the chat box down, but it's the Boyds, which is the coat of arms, and another one, which was a, a member of, I think he lived in Fife. I'm not sure, I can't remember the name of the family. But we, I was basically involved in that for about six months. And um, but during my higher education in art, I began to learn art history through um, Giotto, who, who was an Italian uh, master, basically. And at the time, I wasn't particularly interested in it. I wasn't, I couldn't really understand the enthusiasms of my tutor for this guy and his work. But um, interestingly enough, it was exactly this period in history that we're talking about tonight. And luckily, since then, I've actually started to appreciate what his contribution to not just the art world, but the world was. And, you know, how we see the world today is very much going back to that period in history um, because we able, he was able to um, make faces look a lot more real and they had actual proper human expressions, which was the first time ever. And um, so we're, we're going to be looking at his life a little bit later. Um, but for tonight, I would just like to kick off a little bit with the history of artistry. Now, because people might just assume, like me, if I'm going to do a painting or a drawing, I just go into a cupboard and there's everything I could possibly need and I can order more if I need it. They didn't have that opportunity in the medieval times. If they wanted to make something from art, they had to make the, the materials before they could do that. So we'll move on to the next slide, which is going to show you a little bit about that. Oh, I'm doing it again. Oh, that's it. But it wasn't an entirely difficult process for me to find out how they went about making the materials because we happened to have this wonderful book, which was written by Sinini in around about the time we were about the 1390s, we reckon he wrote this. And it was a book which was produced as a technical guide for apprentice artists in Florence. And he, he basically perpetuated the traditions of Giotto, who we'll talk about later. And, who, and his book instructed readers in methods of making paints and how to the best processes for making your own brushes, which we'll look at as well, charcoal, tracing paper, and all sorts of wiki how of the day. So this guy is really interesting and he's managed to help the, the, the world to see how the craftsmanship of the medieval period went um, went about we went about it so medieval art materials that's what you're looking at right now on the screen interestingly enough and Janina gave us the first known explanation of mixing egg with natural pigments to create tempura so what you can see is there is bowls filled with different um, pigments which are basically just crushed and dried powders which create different colors and they mix with egg and then they become um, actual paints that they can use so all the painting you see up until a very late period um, not so long ago, in fact, it was all made for this process, which was kind of invented around the medieval times, possibly slightly before that. Um, but the pigments that you can see there were, were for, like, they would use terre verte and yellow ochre and burnt ochre to provide um, yellows, greens and browns with maybe some red tones if they mix them. And these could be heated up to produce a variation in tone. Terry and purple was obtained from ground mollusk shells and ultramarine blue from ground lapis lazuli. Lead white was the most common white pigment available to medieval painters, and soup or lamp black was the most common pigment. And anyone who's an artist who's here tonight will recognise a lot of these names from their paint boxes or from their actual tubes of paint they've bought, because the names haven't really changed terribly over the centuries. So egg was also very easy to obtain, and it worked as a very effective binder for these pigments. And voila, we had paints. And suddenly there was no stopping them now because they had all these amazing colours that they could use. And so over the years, they were able to get better access to different paint colours. And so we've managed to get a much wider palette. Now, I particularly like to use charcoal when I'm doing drawing, especially for preliminary sketches. And so, so they did as well in the medieval times. And Janini advised and instructed the medieval artists to gather twigs and to allow them to blacken in the baker's oven of an evening, especially when the baker had stopped working the oven for the day. But the oven should be warm and not roasting. And so the twigs could crisp up and darken in the last of the heat, where they should be left there until morning. So that's very useful advice. So you don't want to pick up a bit of charcoal and it breaks. Oh, try to do this. Now, 
We're now going to move on to medieval brushes. Now, I think this is extremely fascinating, which I hope you will enjoy hearing about. Shanini tells us that brushes should be made from vair hair and peg bristle. For vair brushes, he says, you must pull out the middle hairs of six or eight cooked vair tails and soak them in a drinking glass of clear water. Afterwards, you must trim them until they're all the same length. A vair, I assume, is a hair. Then gather together enough that you produce the thickness that you want for your brushes, some to fit in the shafts of a vulture's feather, some to fit in the shaft of a goose's feather, and some to fit in the shaft of a feather from a hen or a dove. So as you can see in this illustration that I've put up, um, th there's various thicknesses. So I think the one that's at the bottom of the screen could well be a vulture feather. When you tie the hairs together, with thread, you then you tie the hairs together with thread or some waxed silk, and you tuck them into the ends of the feather shaft. Shanini further recommends pushing the hair in as far as you can. Since the stiffer and shorter it, com it comes out, the better and neater it will work for you. But it's a fair point, actually. I would agree with that. Bristle brushes were made in exactly the same way, and it seems as though, as though they needed softening before they were ready to use. So they, he advised you kept some oil inside a tin or lead plate, which is not particularly useful, and like a lamp, using the oil from potentially from a lamp that wasn't no longer needed, and you keep it half filled with oil and you put your brushes in to keep them from drying out, which is exactly what we would do today. Now for rubbing out mistakes, Shanini also suggests when using charcoal, get a feather from a chicken or a goose. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna laugh. So just uh, rub and sweep it over what you've drawn. Or if that doesn't work, you'll need to, to trip, make a trip to the baker's and get a loaf of bread where the centre of the loaf will be ideal to rub out any mistakes. And actually, I've heard about that before, so it's not an uncommon thing. So basically, you used um, a loaf of bread. So that's us. They're sorted for the paint, the brushes and their mistakes. So let's see what they did for their actual surfaces they were going to be painting on. Now, for the 13th century, there, was an there were established paper mills in Spain and Italy, but um, it wasn't until 1340 that, the, uh, that they had, had them in France and Germany in 1390. And probably Britain didn't really catch up with paper mills until about the 15th century. So medieval paper was made from linen rags, which turns out to be much stronger and more durable technically than the wood pulp paper we have today. Rag paper was made by washing rags thoroughly and leaving them to ferment for four or five days. And then they were beaten for some hours in running water, left to fest for a week and then basically until the, the, the actual rags start to disintegrate. They were then piled up as a sandwich and then between pieces of felt and squashed down and dried out, basically. And um, so they were then sized with animal glue made from boiled vellum, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, a large part of medieval art can be found in manuscripts, which basically means a handwritten book. So manuscript art was created on this parchment or vellum rather than on, or, or mostly not on paper, technically at the moment, because they hadn't really got round to this. Although I do think there would have been paper made, it just wasn't such a big scale as it was in the rest of Europe. The word parchment or vellum, vellum is interchangeable since they're both made from the skin of an animal. The process of transforming the animal into clean white material suitable for medieval manuscripts was a highly skilled task of the parchmenter. Now the parchment or parchment maker Vellum was usually made from calf skin, indicated by the root of the word veal. The skins were soaked in a solution of lime and water for between three to ten days, and the parchment maker then began the process of scraping off the hairs. Then rinsing it in a vat or two for a few days to clean off the lime, and it was then pegged out, as you can see in the illustration, of uh, pegged out for days, and the pegs would be tightened in order to keep it from um, losing its shape and it would become really, really, really tight. And eventually it became as tight as a drum. And this made me wonder actually if whatever which came first, the vellum for manuscripts or the invention of the drum skin, because it was actually the same material. And apparently Shanini had warned in his book, the noise from the workshop of the scraping knives against the surface of the skins was quite, it uh, was something to be careful of. But it was nice to see some health and safety tips, but even if the use of lime and lead wasn't seem, seemed to be so dangerous, at least he concerned himself with the noises for the, for the people, which was quite good. Anyway, the dry, opaque 
roughly put opaque because on the right of the screen you can see really what it would have looked like eventually. The, this was in the early stages on the left of the, quick, the drying process. So it was then rolled up and it was taken to be st stored or sold. Parchment is incredibly durable and there are examples which have lasted for a thousand years in perfect condition. So that's highly impressive. So they were, they were all sorted for their, their materials for pr producing their art because they did use that for paintings as well. We're going to move on to another um, very common and very well-known part about medieval art, which is gold. Now, gold was once believed to be the tears of the sun by the Incas and has always been the most universally treasured metal. Because the church was the, was the most important patron of medieval arts, with its demand for religious and divine subject matter, this gave medieval artists the perfect reason to use gold leaf for panel paintings, altar pieces and illuminated manuscripts. Gold allowed for halos of the divine saintly figures and the perfect reason to use a gold leaf for celestial heavenly light. Gold leaf moved from the illuminated manuscripts to being used in large scale architectural settings, such as the Italian fresco paintings, which we'll see a little later. An illuminated manuscript is one that has been decorated in gold or silver, often with elaborate designs. Even though various Islamic societies also practice illuminated art, Europe has had the longest traditions of illuminating the manuscripts. This surface decoration was made by adding gold and silver, which had been forged into very tiny thin leaves called gold leaf or silver leaf. And the process is called gilding. Astonishingly, medieval artists actually used pure 24 karat gold, a higher gold content and or a amount of copper within it resulted in deeper tones of the gold leaf. So they would, they would choose what they wanted in order to create the colors. And the one on the right, you can see the image from the Book of Kells, you can actually see that there's a, a slightly darker tone of gold with lighter tones of gold within that. So it's quite a lot of usage in the gold. A 23 karat gold leaf was composed of 96% gold and 3% silver and 1% copper. The higher the carat, the more durable they were. For artists, they stayed on, they wouldn't have worn away and they didn't tarnish or oxidise. So 18, 12 or 16 karat gold could be alloyed with greater amounts of silver or other metals to achieve lighter tones. To create gold, to create gold panels was a lengthy process involving many artisans. The, the artists were called illuminators and unlike the scribe, had to work at a flat table rather than a sloping desk in order to add the runny gesso underpainting base for the art piece. Gesso was made from mixing plaster of Paris, ground up with white lead, this lead again, and clay that created a pinkish red color behind the gold leaf to add texture and tone to the final piece. And if you look at the, the piece again from the Book of Kells, you can actually see a pinky tone behind the gold leaf. Apparently it made it a warmer and more resilient uh, color. If, it, if the color wore up, if the gold scraped away slightly, the pink wasn't, you know, too bothered. They weren't too bothered about seeing it without the, um, a little bit of a scrape because it could actually looked quite nice behind it. Gave it a slightly nice aged, aged and textured appeal. In order to actually lay the gold um, on top of the gesso, they had to then add a spot of honey to some dried egg white, and that was put down on top of the gesso in order to lay the gold leaf. And they used a flat brush called a gilder's tip. Janini instructs that the illuminator should breathe. Sorry, I'm going to have to laugh again. Janini said the illuminator should breathe heavily onto the manuscript page and the dampness of the breath makes the gesso slightly tacky. That makes sense as well. And the gold leaf could then carefully be placed on the artwork with overlapping edges. The illuminator could then take up a burnishing tool to create a glittering, brilliant surface, which Janini instructed should be made from... <laughs> Dog's tooth mounted on a handle, or even better, the tooth of a lion or a wolf. You know, who knows, that might have been better. And remarkably, so many of them are still actually shining to this day. So Janini knew what he was talking about. So we're going to move on. There's a, as I mentioned earlier, artists are, are very highly influenced by other creative periods in history. And this is a, a really very famous painting by the symbolist artist Gustav Klimt, who painted this in, in 1907. And it's a portrait of Adele Bloch Bauer, and it immortalizes her in one of the most famous paintings probably created in the 20th century. 
It was created during Clint's golden phase, and this painting shows a couple in an embrace, which is supposed to be an expression of desire and reverence. Clint's obsession with gold lasted for nearly a decade and took place at the turn of the 20th century, when the influences were starting to be made of classical Byzantine and Renaissance art. Uh, Klimt's works uh, paid homage to the many centuries of art history, where gold leaf was a commonly applied pigment, as we've just discussed. But his work also introduced the avant-garde Viennese style, re referencing the arts and craft movement, which also influenced the medieval period and its emergence towards Art Nouveau, which we will find out a little bit more about later. So basically a beautiful painting. Most people have seen it. Um, the title is obviously given the, is the kiss, but what, what we'll see in the next slide is that I do think that Klimt wasn't only just influenced by the gold and potentially the patterning, which was given, given a lot of um, you know, scope to in the medieval times. I think he was interested by the shapes of this painting. So click to the next slide and you'll see for yourself. Now this is a, 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 a very early, uh, what they call a codex, which is basically just a book, which was made as a, as in a manuscript format, even though this isn't actually, a, a, this isn't a religious manuscript, this is a manuscript, it's about pictures of illustrations of artists, by artists of different poets. If you look at one on the right hand side, now I see the shape of her head and the way she's leaning down is very, very much, very similar to the, the previous Klimt painting of the kiss. So I think he was interested in the, the kind of symbols of romance that came out of the, the, this period in history. And I think that we've got the, the way, look at the patterning, even some of the, 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 the framing that has been done here is quite similar to a lot of Flint's work. So if you have a look, you know, when you've got time to have a look at his work, I think you'll see it's not just the gold that influenced him, it's the stylizing and there's also outlines around the characters here. And I also love the relaxed face on the guy who's sitting down, who's having, it looks like a bird eating something off his hand. So the whole thing's just so so fluid and it's so happy and relaxed. So these were made to inspire people. Um, these, these, draw, these drawings, and there's a whole book made of them. Um, and I think that it, it's a kind of nod back to illuminated manuscripts because they're not, this isn't a religious context. Um, but I suppose in Scotland, just worth mentioning at the point of talking about illuminated manuscripts is that the Book of Kells was believed actually to have been created at about 800 AD, but it was also meant to have been created poorly in, in, in Iona, rather than, you know, it's, it lives in Ireland now, but we think it was originally from Iona, because that was the key location in Scotland for insular art or art from the common Celtic style. It developed in Britain and Ireland from you know, around about, the, about 500 AD. But this is a really nice, so if you have a look at this at any point on the internet, it's a really nice piece. You get, you get to see all the different pictures that have gone in, in illustration have gone into this book. And like I say, they're, they're meant to be more of the, a picture of the, of the poet rather than a picture to represent the actual poem. So it's not necessarily an illustration, it's more of a portrait. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next slide, which will be, telling us a wee bit more about Giotto. I'm going back to him again, not just because my art teacher, my, 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 my art history teacher told me I should, but I actually think now we discovered that he actually turns out to be, he was as important as, as my art history teacher made out. Because in the 14th century, we see important developments, developments coming into art. And we get to see intricate folds and in clothing, we get to see highlights, we get to see realism. But most importantly for me, the development of figures who actually have community expressive faces. Now that was an absolutely huge breakthrough. That had not happened before really anywhere. Um, and look at the 3D and the face. I mean, that face, those faces that you can see there, which come from one of his um, frescoes inside a chapel in uh, Florence are, are incredible. And in his life, he produced an enormous amount of work. Um, and this, this one is one of his most famous, again, as I say, because of its advancements and manipulating not only the, the actual features, but also the space and the atmosphere that this created. So you need to um, just, I think you need to maybe look a bit at the earlier period to see what was going on then, to see that, to appreciate that. Um, but over the course of his life, he continued to develop this style and his work was believed to have been a major influence on in Michelangelo, who painted the remarkable ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the early 1500s. This, the chapel was reputed to have taken Michelangelo to, 
26 years, but he mainly laid on his, lay on his back on scaffolding. So dedication, but his, as I say, his influence was to try to at least emulate what Giotto had done. And the picture on the right is a sculpture which has been made of Giotto uh, later, and he's, he's carrying his tools of the trade. And also you can see that he's wearing a hood and, and a, a kind of jacket to work in because they were working in huge scale and it was it would have been really pretty messy. Up, they were mostly up in scaffolding. The work that he produced was, was huge inside chapels and various great halls in Italy. And this is a, a painting which um, is a large, was a large scale mural. And what we're looking at here is just, again, look at the expressions on the faces, some use of the gold, and um, also the fact that it was, I, can't, I, I should have written down how big this is. I didn't actually, I, I did mean to, but it is absolutely immense. So this would have taken him years to complete. But most importantly, this is one of the frescoes which were done, which were invented basically in Italy at this time. Frescoes was a new technique involving applying pigment to lime plaster. And it was still fresh, it hadn't dried, hence the name of the painting being fresco. And it was the use of this paint, this painting type um, of using frescoes, doing enormous scale works with detail that actually gained the, the Italy's Italian, sorry, the Italian uh, artists a great head start in being, you know, probably a way ahead of the game in Europe than anywhere anybody else was doing, maybe anywhere in the world. We're not, we can't be sure of that, but absolutely remarkable. But this was probably due to the fact that Italy was a major centre for trade in Europe during the 14th and 15th century, and so they had their fair share of wealthy merchants. This wealth then trickled down to the artists who by and large worked for merchants or for the church, who also benefited from, from the wealth. So here we find probably the first well-known and wealthy artists on a similar scale perhaps to Damien Hurst or um, David Hockney today. So that's another first for the, the 14th century, century artists. So we'll move on to the next slide, um, which is given us a little bit of a comparison. Um, he was th this. This is a comparison to what was happening in Europe, uh, probably about the same time, but 1350. I'm saying in Europe, and it sounds a wee bit like I'm talking about the whole place as one place, but actually I am in this case talking about it. It's one place because Europe was by and large. Um, run and, and funded by royal families who were all pretty much connected through marriages. So they were influenced enormously by each other, by, the, by whatever art they were interested in. And artists would move around between them all to paint portraits. So, so there wasn't really anybody who wasn't producing art who, who weren't getting paid by one of the medieval royal families in Europe. And this painting here is the start of what people have found as the first of those paintings, which is starting to show expression rather than, you know, a sort of heavy, not particularly lifelike paintings that they had been producing in Europe. And beside it, there's a st the start of a, a new trend, which was coming a little bit later in the 1300s. And this is, this is showing expression. You can see there's a similar, you know, attitude that um, Giotto had, but I'd say that it was the, uh, the, 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 the that this weight, the weight of the character isn't quite right, you know, the, the length of the arms, whereas Giotto had got it pretty amazingly spot on for that period in history, but at least they were trying. And so we're seeing an emergence of this, but um, of, often in the, at this period of history, what they say is that we were, we were living in the Gothic period, but Gothic period is generally used to describe art, which is, is from the, the, Roman, the Romanesque period during the 12th century. Variations within the style are usually named early, high, Italian, international and late Gothic. European features had common, you know, as I say, common features throughout, but I'd say that Scotland probably would have had the same type of art as we're seeing here. Um, although we can't really say, but particularly, and to be fair to Robert II, it was probably shortly after him that this would have happened because that he, he was married in to a Scottish noble family, as was his son, but all these grandchildren who were his predecessors after that, they all married European wives or husbands. So they would have brought this European style to, to each year, it's interspersed again. So it's quite, it's quite um, fluid at that point. But so Robert II, if he had art, would have been probably quite unique. He wouldn't have necessarily been copying any other styles. And um, 
but and we're going to talk a wee bit more about Scottish art uh, at that period um, just shortly. What we're going to talk about now is that the, Sc the people in medieval times seem to be very fascinated by animals and imaginary beasts. Although to be fair, people who may have th thought that lions or tigers or elephants or camels or leopards or even, you know, quite you know animals that we're used to seeing in documentaries. They would think they were mystical beasts, the same as we would see potentially a unicorn or, a, or a, a phoenix. And they would only know about them because people had told them about them. So they give descriptions of what they were like. And what we find in their art um, of animals, which, which occurs a lot in their illuminated manuscripts, is these really odd uh, interpretations of animals. And in this case, I'm going to draw your attention to, to, the, to the actual human characters that you can see. Both of them look to me identical. They look as though they've been traced. So I'm thinking that they might have used that we were talking earlier about the very, very, what they do with the vellum is scrape it really, really thin and add more oil and actually becomes tracing paper. It looks to me as if the, the, the characters here have been are identical, but also to draw, draw attention to the, the strange blueness of the animals, which wouldn't have existed. So somebody must have explained what they looked like who'd maybe seen these animals or third, second, third hand. And they said it was a kind of bluey tone, but it could have easily have been a gray or a, a, another color that they couldn't explain and maybe didn't have it in their palette box. They've just gone for blue. So it also looks very odd for us, but basically this type of art is called bestiary. And these are from the Aberdeen bestiary, which is from around a little bit earlier, from about 1200. And the reason I'm showing it is because it continued to be popular right up until the you know 1300s and probably beyond that, but certainly over that 100 to 150 year period. It's a compendium basically of real and imaginary creatures. And all, a lot of these creatures have been written as if it's natural history, as if it's an explanation of an encyclopedia. But actually, there's a moral, a moral tale behind them all. So, and often what they're saying about the creatures isn't necessarily that correct. Um, the, there's a rare use of green that I'm seeing here. They, doesn't, they don't seem to have been able to mix particularly good green. There's a, a little bit of a shade of it in the fish at the bottom of the left-hand page. But what I do see is an incredibly uh, strong use of gold, which was, we, we can imagine how much this is going to have cost when we see that we remember that the gold was 24 karat gold. Um, now, evidence from this about this manuscript shows that it may have belonged to a royal family or their royal family and been passed down not the Scottish royal family that we know of, but um, and it, it was likely to have been acquired at some stage during the Middle Ages. Now, this is a this is another couple of uh, images from the, the Aberdeen Bay City. Now, what we see, and I really like this uh, representation of a lion, potentially, or a leopard, because it's got lots of spots. And somebody must have decided that they're going to explain what a lion looked like. And, you know, we, we know that that's what it's meant to be. But it's a really interesting form. It also tells you that the people who were making these had probably never seen any of these animals, which is perfectly normal in that period in our history. But this bestiary was, as I say, was from the Ab Aberdeen uh, collection. But the first known one, the first one that was ever known, was um, was made of was made up of French verse by Philip de Theon, which was written around about eleven twenty one, and it was dedicated to Queen Adela, of, uh, the wife of Henry the First. Another copy was made later for Ele Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was around 1124 to about 1204, and she became the wife of Henry II. Interestingly, animals were often used to describe, to describe people, such as we see with William the Lion, the 12th century Scottish king, and Eleanor of Aquitaine was nicknamed the Lioness. We assume because she had a strong personality. Probably, probably I would say, she didn't settle for any nonsense either, and that she became something of a demigoddess in medieval storytelling. Now, I want you to remember too that storytelling at that time was an art form. So the, if she was involved in the stories, you know, that's quite, quite, and also they didn't have very much written down evidence. So they could easily write, a, speak about people and nobody could tell you whether it was true or it wasn't because there wasn't a lot of information there. But anyway, so it's a very interesting piece of um, medieval art. And I think it's fascinating their um, kind of general, um, interest in animals, interest in the world of animals, interest in animals that we've probably never see, and how they, they, they mix animals up into morals. And we'll see a wee bit more about that in a wee minute. And what we see here is a 
This is from the, the Oxford Bestiary, which is was meant to have contained the most beautiful representations of creatures and the ones that had the most personalities within the stories that were written about them. I'd say it was probably quite similar to Beatrix Porter and what she tried to do with her rabbits and jackets and various other creatures. However, Beatrix Porter was writing predominantly for children. These were natural history with moral tales written mainly for adults um, and collectors collecting them for adults and people would sit and read these. And, and I really must admit, I really love this archer with his trying to shoot the magpies out of the tree. And the magpies aren't remotely interested. They don't seem to be bothered by him. There'll be a moral tale behind that. I just haven't actually got the story for you. And the other one here is a, a really interesting uh, drawing of some kind of jackal. I put wolf in the description, but I'm wondering if it actually might be a jackal. It's a very strange, and the one above it is clearly meant to be an antelope, but no one's ever actually seen one. Or an ibex or one of these you know, creatures from... Um, an African antelope of some sort. So it's all very interesting what they actually saw and what they think, but, but the fact that they were so interested in animals is also quite interesting. Now this one is, a, again, looking at this, using the, the, the art in the manuscripts to tell moral tales. This is a beautiful piece, beautifully uh, painted, every part of it's lovely. You even start to see highlights on the, the, the curl, curl of the leaves and the trees. And the, I just think it's a really lovely composition as well. But this is called the Peridin's tree and it supposedly grows in India and doves were supposed to have gathered in the tree because they liked to eat the sweet fruit of the tree. And because they were, they were up there, they were safe from the dragon and they've said dragon in descriptions, but I would say this is more a wyvern, which I'll explain later why, what that is. Well, and, um, it seems that they hated the doves, these dragon wyvern creatures, and would harm them if they could. But it fears the shadow of the peregrine tree, and it stays in the unshaded side. The doves then stay in the shadow. The doves st that stay in the shadow are safe, but any who leave are caught and eaten. Now, this is obviously a tale which has got some kind of moral, presumably a Christian tale, which means that, you know, as long as you stay a faithful Christian, you're safe from the devil as long as you stay in the church. In this case, it seems to break with tradition because the dove doesn't seem to mind about the story and it seems to be talking to the dragon or wyvern. And I can't imagine what they might have to say, but it um, certainly breaks with the tradition of this old, old legend. So it makes you wonder that perhaps the artist was um, breaking and decided to look at the stories again and say, well, do you know what is that story about and getting people to start thinking about it. So maybe, maybe a wee bit of rebellion forming there with these um, stories but anyway the next part uh, I think you will find really interesting. Now there could be no fewer more bizarre examples of medieval fascination for rabbits and animals and the strange obsession with killer rabbits. After the medieval manuscripts we find what we call marginalia which is artwork surrounding the margins of the page. We, are, we often have odd creatures sometimes monsters half beasts half man, half beast, strangely, rabbits as well. It seems that the medieval artists like to create the world turned upside down, where roles were reversed and the impossible becomes normal. Almost an early surrealist period, if you ask me, of art like the work, works of Dali and Max, Max Ernst, which was around about 1920s. These are superb illustrations of early cartoons which clearly show humour and satire, although it's fair to say that, that reputedly introduced by Romans, rabbits could well have been a serious threat to food supplies, decimating crops of cabbages, say, in one sitting, and could be hard to stop since they could easily dig under walls or wooden or wicker fencing. Religious institutions often had sizable gardens, and so perhaps the artist was showing something of the true extent of the work of the killer rabbits and that the humans were losing the battle. Killer rabbits crop up in France, Belgium, Germany and England in the 1300s. Rabbit hunting, rabbits hunting humans, jousting on the backs of snails, um, carrying humans, you know, up, tied up. And also the axe wielding rabbit, which looks a bit like a, a Viking coming to, to do some damage. Um, and interesting, if you look at the, the, the story of the Peasants' Revolt, which happened in 1381, it's in Auburn's. It was the rebels that took control of the pillory and put a rabbit in it. The pillory was a wooden frame with holes for the heads and the hands, where offenders were imprisoned and exposed for public 
uh, humiliation, often having rotten cabbages thrown at them. Perhaps there's a connection, but it seems that some of the reason the peasants chose a rabbit as a symbol to embody a sense of social protest, was, we're not quite sure what the reason would be, but there's some kind of, it's, there ha they have must have some kind of attitude towards rabbits as being rebels or being, you know, some undisciplined part of the society. I suppose they could be hares, technically, but rat, we know that hares were often used as a, to symbolise cowardice, and these don't look particularly cowardly to me. Now, this is a particularly nice example. This is from Smithfield, a, a manuscript which was created in the 1340s. This manuscript contains multiple marginal illustrations where stories unfold over consecutive pages, almost like a comic strip. When we find a rabbit archer shooting a hunter in the back, then the rest of the gang tie him up and haul him before a rabbit judge to be tried. And after the guilty verdict is delivered, the ruthless rabbits drag the hunter away and he's basically beheaded and put to death. It's a, probably a cautionary tale, or perhaps an early comic strip artist who had no other outlet for his imaginings. What's interesting is that the theme seems to run across Europe, and it made me wonder that perhaps there was a story being told by travelling maestros about the kingdom of the warrior rabbits, which had been lost to time, and that these were the form of illustration illustrating the story, but have perhaps we'll never know. But there's so much more that if you want to check on the internet, there's so many more of these. And like I say, this is a really nice example because it actually looks as if it's made as a as a, a comic strip book, as an aside to the actual text. And also, what's amazed me is that no one seemed to mind them doing it, or perhaps they didn't notice. Maybe no one actually read these books. So the guy got away with it, but also please just also note what a fantastic illustration we're looking at. The detail, the patterning, the actual scale of the rabbit and the, the, the facial expressions of the of the rabbits is, is amazing. So yep, so I really like the killer rabbits. So okay, we're moving on to sculpture now, which is a really important part of 14th century art. And um, of any sculptor would probably have a large block of stone or wood on his workbench, using chisels, gouges and mallets, working away pretty much all the time. They were absolutely incredibly talented. They, they just had produced some of the most amazing work. And I'm not sure that we could really do what they've done by hand today. The final appearance of sculptures can be really delicate. And we can see here, this is a wonderful example, which is a, a wonderful courtly love lady's ivory mirror case. Um, it's quite small. Um, I think it's, I can't remember I had the diameter, so it's two, maybe about two centimetres, two or not two, five centimetres across or something. But what I wanted to pay, take your attention to is that the, the, the figures are almost dramatic. They're almost like Shakespearean in their, their actual movements and their, their positions that they're in. Now, at this time, we also find the rise of the chival chivalric romances, like Tristan and Isolde, became a really popular story and they were actually producing like novels that people were starting to read in the 1300s. So they were able to read about real acts of romance and love in as opposed to in real life for most nobles, and I'm not sure, probably in some degree, the people who weren't nobles had arranged marriages. Marriages were arranged to, you know, create power, you know, power bases and to make alliances. It's nothing really to do with love per se, and often they were arranged for people with children. So, but I was wondering perhaps if at this stage people were starting to question about that and maybe they were starting to say, well, do you know, I want to make some more choices for myself. And now this is a, a mirror case, which could easily have been a secret object, which could have been hidden away and could easily have been not made, you know, we might, they might not want their fathers or the people who arranged the marriage to know, or it could be actually based on a real story about somebody's life and they've asked someone to make this for them. But it's a beautiful piece and um, fantastic to have an example of sculpture of this quality from that period. Now, I've, drawn, I've taken you to um, these fantastic sculptures which are outside Dindono Castle. Now these are, this one in particular I've, I've kind of zoomed in on is what we believe is two lions or probably lionesses because they don't have manes. 
They've been out there for at least 650 years at the top of the hill, out at the elements. And yet we can still see detail in them. We can see that there's a, if you zoom in a bit closer, which you, you might be able to do with your screen, you can see actually see chest hairs that have been put in as detail. I've tried to draw them in to show you. You can see detail of um, their ears. You can even see eyes, but we can also see that there's a, there's, the tails have been put on some for some reason between their legs coming out round the back, which in our culture would symbolise um, capitulation or some form of, you know, giving in to somebody else. It's a complete and utter mystery. We don't really know why why they were there, what they were there for. But what we do know is they would have been probably commissioned by a very, very high paid, probably highly paid and very eminent artist in Scotland because this was going to be going on to the king's royal household. And also the fact that they survived this long shows how well they've been made. So if anyone knows the answer to some of these questions, we would be very pleased to find out more because this is an eternal mystery, as is who the artist is. We have no idea who that is. Another really amazing example of, 14, of 14th century art is actually inside in Donald Castle, basically on the other side of the wall where the lions are. What we find is that there's a, a, a fantastic pair of sculpted heads with shoulders, technically called busts, although they're not particularly big. So they haven't got much of the shoulder in. Maybe I'm not quite sure how low down the body they have to be in order to be called busts, but these are um, amazing examples of you know sculpture that we do actually have that we can see from that period now they're inside what would have been the feasting hall inside a window and they're thought to be of on the left was meant to be queen euphemia and on the right we think was robert ii so we think it was ones that he had made of his wife and himself very high up the wall looking down where they presumably would have had their, um, the, the design on a high table underneath the area where the, um, the busts are. And we think that probably they were there to show either their status as going to or that they were there to um, basically to show their devotion to each other. So we don't really know. But again, we don't know who made them and we don't know whether they're, you know, what, you know, what, what their actual purpose was, although it's a fair, a fair idea it was probably to do with status and to show devotion. And we, then I have to also ask the question, there was two there, what other sculptures were in there that we don't know about anymore, which I'd love to find out, but we might never know. But anyway, in my opinion, these should be in the, the, the medieval art spotter's guide. If there was one, they're so high up, you would need to take binoculars to see them if you want to see them really clearly. But I certainly recommend to come along. And if there was such a thing as a spotter's guide, as I say, I think they should be in it. But I don't think there is such a thing yet. So anyway, move on to some of the fantastic pieces of art, which we know were made in Scotland in the 14th century. Now, this is the uh, Snavernake horn, and it is potentially an ivory elephant's tusk, which has been decorated, but in the 12th century and the 14th century, it was given these incredibly intricate enamel gilt mounts which are to, to in order to hope so you could tie it on to a belt or a, a, a shoulder strap and it's been decorated throughout and there's also circles round round the horn which were put in in the 14th century and it's probably a hunting horn we guess and it's sometimes also called the Bruce horn since it was at one time the possession of Thomas Lord Bruce it was the third Earl, Earl of Elgin in the 1700s it's now in the British Museum the internal rim of the silver band has, has got 16 hawks preening themselves on it, and the outside faces of both bands show engravings of animals, including the unicorn and the lion, so they've mixed imaginary and, um, and real animals together again. In the centre upper band, has, they have they've got a king who's in conversation with a bishop, um, with a forester standing alongside, so it's probably a, the horn that became an heirloom in some way. It was inherited um, and put into the museum from the wardens of Snaver uh, Snake Forest in Wiltshire, though it's thought to have been made in Scotland from the Earl of, for the Earl of Murray in the 14th century, and it was looted by the English in the mid-16th century, meaning that it could well have been in the family of Robert, Robert II's first wife, Euphemia, who was for, first married to John Randolph, who was the second Earl of Murray in the early 1300s. So there could be that... Um, um, Euphemia would have actually known about this horn. So that's a really lovely piece. The next piece 
from the what is century Scottish art is this fantastic brooch, which is called the Kames brooch. It's another amazing example. Of, um, it would have been cast uh, in in. I think I think it's actually bronze, or it could be gold. Uh, I've, 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 and it's a, probably a mixture of both. I think, judging by the colour, and it was um, it's about two and a half centimetres long. It's not particularly big, and it was handed as an heirloom from the McGregors. We were thought to have inherited it through marriage from an heiress of the MacLeods of Bernera, who have been, who were relatives of the Bute Stuarts. It's now in the museum uh, in Edinburgh, National Museum in Edinburgh. Here we find wyverns again, so we're kind of intrigued by these creatures now. There's a chain of six of them, which which are supposed to symbolise courage and strength, or even a symbol of protection. Wyverns have been associated with vengeance, with the concept of slaying the dra one's dragon but they're actually just basically dragons without wings and they've got wee tiny wings as though they've been fused to the body. They're sort of, some of them have that, some of them don't have any wings and it kind of implies a loss of flight or a taming of a dragon. However, they only have two legs, so most dragons have four. Typically, they've represented the sting of an arrow at the end of their tails, much like a scorpion, which I wondered might appeal to medieval archers who'd be seek, who would seek to uh, send a lethal arrow. Wyverns also appear on standards at the Bay Bayou Tapestry. Uh, these are covered in scales like tiny chain mail. If you can, if you can see the detail, it's incredible detail. And there's little eye sockets that have been drilled and added uh, blue glass to. And the circular punch marks on the back are exquisite because you can see the detail of their backbones. And on the back, which you can see on the right hand side of the screen, it's got an elaborate inscription, which basically has a multi Maltese cross and it kind of mentions about the wise men, which could imply that the wearer should follow the star, follow their own star or follow the star of Jesus. And it was probably worn as a protective charm. It was preserved by the family of the Bannant, Bannant, Bannatines of Kames. That's a castle and estate on the east of the island of Butte. And it may have come from the court of Robert the Bruce or from James V High Steward. It was Robert the Bruce's grandfather who owned the lands of Butte as well as Dundonald and Renfrewshire. So it kind of fits into that period. So we were wondering if there was some kind of connection there. This is an amazing piece, which um, we do we pretty much are absolutely certain is either connected to Robert II or his father, Walter VI High Stuart. It's called the Butte Maser, and it comes from the same period, roughly, potentially, as the Kames brooch. Some suggestions have, have been that they were made by the same people. It also has wyverns. You probably can't see it, but uh, around the outer edge, beyond the lion, in the centre, there's uh, a, a wyvern, and then there's a flower and a wyvern. So it's three wyverns and three flowers. The flowers look to me like the, the Jacobite rose, the symbol of the Stuarts. And uh, what we see there is a, is a lion in relief. And if you also note that the lion has its tail between its legs, which again we saw earlier in the lines at Dundonald Castle, again, we don't know what that means, but it's quite possible that this was a, potentially a wedding gift given to Walter, the sixth high steward, when he got married to Marjorie Bruce, who's the daughter of Robert the Bruce. But that has just been one theory. And the reason for that is because between the lion's front paws, you can see the the um, shield of, the, of the, the High Stewards of Scotland, of which at that time Walter was, was the High Steward of Scotland. But, but around the other side of them, around the line, it is all people who were supporters and very high, high office supporters of Robert the Bruce himself. So it could easily be to do with him. This could have been given to him, we don't really know. So what we're seeing is the coat of arms of basically his chief counsellors, I guess you can call them, uh, Sir James Douglas, John Fitzgilbert, Crawford of Loudoun, Sir John Stuart, who was the Lord of Arran, and also the Earl of Menteith, all around the other side. And what's most notable, notable, notable about both of these objects is that Scotland at this time were capable of craftsmanship of this level, and they were designing pieces like this and there would have been a lot more of them. It's just these are the ones that we've been able to find. And the sad thing is we don't know who actually made them. But what I think is the same school of artists who have been creating this symbolism around the Bruce Stewart dynasty, the, you know, the connections between the two. And I think that uh, 
that's in the museum in uh, Edinburgh. I certainly recommend to go and see it. I think it's on loan actually from Mount Stewart House in Butte. And then that, um, so I thought that was one, a lovely piece. So I'm going to move forward slightly to a bit further forward in history because I want to tell you about the other people who were involved in painting kings and painting important sort of after the effect of painting Scottish kings basically because we don't know what any of them looked like because we don't have any contemporary paintings so this guy was actually quite interesting because he was one of the very first significant Scottish artists uh, George um, Jameson from Aberdeen and he got the job of uh, going and painting portraits for um, of every single one of the Scottish uh, kings and queens well, I think mainly the kings. I don't know the way the queens were involved. They must have been. I don't. I haven't seen that written anywhere. And he was. Um, what was it? He did 109 imaginary portraits of historical monarchs in Scotland, and there were decorations for Charles the First. And Jameson's fame actually became even well known after doing these portraits, because he did actually do one for Charles the First, who is said to have been so delighted with it that he actually gave Jameson a ring off his finger as a reward. This series of portraits probably had Robert II in it, although I've been able, I've been unable to find that anywhere to show you. So it could be that that's one of the ones that is wasn't wasn't there or hasn't been, it hasn't been able to be found. I did, however, find the one of David II, who was the son of Robert the Bruce and uncle of Robert II. Charles had a, had a sign put up to display all these paintings. Charles I, and it said. Um, Basically, it was a Stuart, a Stuart dynasty patronage, and it said, by endorsement of an ancient and venerable line of the kings of Scottish kings, the Stuarts were divinely appointed to rule Scotland. Moreover, the rule would ensure the same peace and continuity as that of the of their valiant predecessors, the Fergus I, the legendary first king, and Robert the Bruce, the progenitor of the Stuart dynasty. Well, we know that isn't strictly true. But I'm sure Robert the Bruce wouldn't have been too bothered about he read about knowing that was said. I think he would just be quite pleased to think that his dynasty had continued that long and who had who had that level of uh, patronage towards the art. So I think he's an interesting guy to look out for. You don't hear much about him, but he's probably the very first of the kind of school of Scottish art artists that we, that we start to find. And there's a lot of people came out of his his period in time and basically pat, patronized again, as I see, by the by the royal family and and mainly by wealthy merchants who were in Aberdeen. Now this is another one which, you, which is really interesting. Uh, again, within the same kind of idea, there was a patronage of an artist to come and paint all the Scottish kings. And this one was by a guy called Jacob de Vett II. And he had done, been asked to do a collection for the Holyrood, for Holyrood House, the Palace of Holyrood, when it was being built or added to. And he was asked by James, it was Charles II this time, to come and repaint the whole collection. And luckily, we found there was one of Robert II. Now, what is it? He looks very, um, he looks quite as if he's from a Greek odyssey of some sort. He doesn't look particularly Scottish. He's wearing a really uh, interesting helmet and clothing, but he does look like a warrior. And of course, Robert II would have been involved in quite a lot of war, not not as much as earlier kings, but he certainly would have been. Um, having to deal with a lot of trouble in wars. But he, this is one's interesting because he also, Charles II also made a little statement to put beside all these paintings that he, that he got. Apparently it was, it was over um, 111 portraits done along with um, 118 kings that were totally um, full length paintings. So he's basically said, the said James de, de, de White, he's obviously changed the, the spelling, binds and obliges him to completely draw and finish and perfect the pictures of the Hale Kings who have reigned over this kingdom of Scotland from King Fergus I to King Charles II, our gracious sovereign, who now reigns inclu inclusive being all in number 110. So he was actually added in for the, the last painting. So he's basically upstaged Charles I by doing another lot of paintings and he's added another little little limb. Um, Thing about about them, he hasn't mentioned so much about the Stuarts in this case. If you look at it, but he's still mentioning himself and how the the, the Kingdom of Scotland, and the, because he actually came back up here. Um, I think he was. He, I think he was. I think he spent a bit of time here building up a lot of the castles and a lot of the um, 
the great stately homes as well. He was very interested in patronising the arts. So that's the Charles II story. But just to really, I'm going to just move on. We're not much longer to go, I guess, but I wanted to just really look back to the period of the, the time when I was talking about how people have been influenced by medieval, medieval artists. And I'm going to look at William Morris because I think he's particularly interesting. Because he was um, a guy from the Victorian times, as you can see from his dates. But he had a fascination for the medieval culture. He genuinely believed that people from medieval times had much stronger uh, spiritual and um, values of, of creative integrity, I think was probably a good way to put it. Because he felt that that had been lost in the Victorian industrial age. And he thought that the, all the skills that the people used to have, that we've seen from some of the pieces of art tonight, so he wasn't too far wrong in my opinion, he felt that those skills were getting lost into the industrial age where everything's getting made in factories. He was also very concerned about the damage that was being made to the environment um, through factories and the cutting down of forests and mining. And he was actually quite an activist, an environmental activist, but particularly though, notably, he was very upset by the industrial age in the Victorian times where everything was getting made as a scene factories, but the people were getting paid terrible, terrible pay wages and really terrible living conditions. So he was really angry about that. So he decided that he was going to set up himself. So he was emulating how things were made, how weaving was done. He set up tapestry workshops. He wanted to recreate uh, designs. And we can see the one on the right. It's an absolutely beautiful piece of fabric design, pattern design based very much on, a, 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 you can see there, it looks very much like a, a, something that might have been in one of those illuminated manuscripts. And it's just a stunning piece. And these are all actually in available to see in Walthamstow, in Waltham, it's in the house that he used to live in there, William Morris, a wonderful place to go, it's a beautiful garden, and there's some amazing pieces of his work. And it talks you through this whole feeling that he didn't really agree with what was happening with industrialization. And of course, we would agree with him to the, most people this day would also agree with them, especially his destruction of the planet and you know destruction of, of industrialization and the loss of skills. Because like I said earlier, a lot of these carvings and people wouldn't probably be able to do these anymore to that level. And I do think there has been a uh, skills loss, but but William Morris took it to another level, but he also took it to another level where he actually got quite rich. So he was able to buy that house in Waltham, so he was able to buy more other big houses and he got together with other artists and he created these amazing, this is a replica of his idea of a of a, a medieval tapestry. Now, if you were to see that hanging in Dundonald Castle, for example, no one would think it was out of place. No one would think, oh, that's, you know, that's a William Morris that's been put there because it looks identical, even how they've moved the threads to give that 3D effect, etc. the shiny and, and the text. It's just a really lovely piece. That's actually... Um, a really good example and he made a lot of money selling these because they became ridiculously popular people were really really keen to start looking back to medieval times and in a way they kind of romanticized it a little bit more than they probably should have because people who have studied medieval history know perfectly well there was very little romance in terms of everyday living in medieval times a lot of hardship and difficulties and in, in the ship the chivalric values and things like that were, were probably were good but what about things like everyday living conditions there was no medicines there was no running water you know a lot of difficulties and to be fair in the 1350s they were living through things like the last blasts of the uh, the 12th 13th century ice age they had the plague that happened in 1350 they were at constant war in scotland pretty much from you know the start to the pretty much the or halfway through to near the end of the 14th century so we were left they were left with a a, a difficult economy and I don't think things are particularly good. And they lost, they lost about a third of the people in Scotland to plague. So, but anyway, so I'll move on from plague to this lovely painting, um, which is one of Morris's, which is rare. There doesn't seem to be very many of them are surviving. Now, this is interesting because it's been called Lady Guinevere. But in actual fact, it's more likely to be, um, you know, I was talking earlier about Tristan and Isolt. And I think this is probably his version of Isolt. But what we can see is, amazing patterning look at the colors but also i want to draw your attention to the fact that this would have been painted using the same materials as medieval people because morris refused to use new methods he studied to find out how they went about things that would have been painted on board it would have been painted using um the, the same methods of mixing paint hence the colors are quite similar 
if you look at the colours, the bright, bright reds, the, you know, the use of the, the lead white and everything like that that he's got in there. It's a stunning painting, and that's, as I say, that was actually his wife that he uses his model. Now, there was a few other artists who came out at that time. Rossetti, for example, painted some stunning paintings that were romanticising um, the medieval period. But they were only they were doing it for the same reason. They were looking back to the past and they wanted to, to, to for that period in history not to be forgotten as well. So it wasn't all bad. It was just that I think that a lot of people this these days do think of medieval period as being quite romantic, not based on the actual stuff that was happening at the time, but this this whole resurgence and interest in medieval, which continued into the 1920s and the 1900s, because then this moved into being Art Nouveau, which was all about creating almost organic, slightly medieval shapes and forms. And one of the really good examples to look at is um, Charles Rennie McIntosh's wife, Margaret MacDonald. She made those stunning pieces of art that were very similar to Morris. And I think that she was probably one of the very strong medievalist artists in Scotland, looking back, but also creating lovely patterning and, and design for the 20th century. So basically, that's the end of the show folks. This is the, a little reminder, if anybody's really interested in Gothic Renaissance or any art from this period that we've been talking about tonight, there's actually an exhibition on in Edinburgh in the National Gallery, which is just off the main drag of Princess Street up at the mound. And what you, you want to check it out on the internet. Now, to just to, to also remind you to make sure you book in advance, because they're doing what every, mostly everybody's doing now, you have to make sure there's going to be space for you to get in. It is free, but also to make sure it's open and things like that if you were going to go to Edinburgh. Um, so I highly recommend to try and see that while it's here. And that all that remains to be said is thank you very much for coming along and I'll hand back over to Blythe. Thank you so much, Gwen. That was really interesting. That is fantastic. Do you want to stop sharing? And then we should be able to see everyone. And just a reminder, guys, we are still recording. So if you don't want your faces in the video, don't feel like you have to turn your cameras on, but feel free to turn your cameras on if you want to ask a question or you can pop a question if you have any questions in the uh, chat box and I will pass it along to Gwen. Otherwise, I guess just to get us rolling, because no one's come forward just now, um, I will ask the question, and I wrote it down sort of right in the beginning, but then you kind of answered it, but I might ask it anyway. Go for it. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I know you, you mentioned Klimt, and then towards the end you were talking about Morris, but I wondered if there's anyone else that you've noticed or any other really famous works of art that you personally have noticed that you think are really influenced by this period in any way? I think uh, I think I probably mentioned Rossetti, right? I don't know if I did mention Dante. He's got a couple of names in front of him. He's got kind of three or four names, but a Rossetti who did the most wonderful paintings of the Lady of the Lake, a more modern version than, than the older fashioned fabled version. And uh, same kind of colours and things like that. And he was from the same period. They were probably friends. I do think that they all hung out together. William Morris and um, what, what was the other guy? Which um, is it, I think he's, he was he was mainly involved in textiles as well. But, but I, again, I've mentioned about you know what Charles Rennie McIntosh was doing was an an, arch an architectural, really interesting interiors look at that period in history and creating the shape because you use a lot of metal, you use a lot of the kind of scrolling and metals, which was in the Art Nouveau period. And I think that he was probably interested in that. And I think he, I think that the, the Klimt thing, uh, situation with the gold, this obsession, which did last for, I think it was at least 10 years, the, 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 he was obviously very, very into this and pushing the boundaries of that quite a bit. And I think that that, that influenced a lot of other artists that came out of the, you know, the 30s and 40s. They were really interested in using the metal and the gold although they wouldn't be using 24 karat gold, I wouldn't think. <laughs> that was a, it's entirely reserved for the medieval period. <laughs> Indulgences. And you got, I should say, I didn't mean to skip over this, you got a really um, fantastic comment from Liz, sort of around the same period, which made me think about this around the same period in your talk. And she said, really interesting to see how uh, 
the kiss by Klimt uses so much from the codex, from the codex painting, uh, and it will make me look at Klimt's work in a new way. So she said, thank mm, you. Good. Yeah, well, it was just a, a fantastic to see that, you know, exactly that sort of, um, I think when you study, I, I think that's another thing about when I called it, I called it an alien artist obsession. I think, I think it's, it's when you notice something, you want to know more, and then you start to make connections. It's not, it's not all that different from being like a historian, I guess, because you're looking at connections between dates and things that have happened and how did they overlap in history and art. It's like he obviously was looking at codex and he, he obviously was looking in detail, whatever he could have got his hands on. He lived in Austria most of his life, but he would have got a, a opportunity to presume because that was actually that codex was from Germany. So I don't know whether he was able to go to a museum to see it. And then, you know, he started maybe just some sketches. But yeah, that's a, that's a really that's a good point. Thank, thanks, Liz. That's a good point. Yeah, this is this is a fun one from Kirstein. What about this as a topic for our education program? Ooh, we could do it for the art the art pupils. They might be interested in it. Yeah, I think we'll have to talk about that, Gwen. That would be fun. That's more you than me, really, because like like Lauren had said this in the comments as well that this is that this is fascinating. It's completely out of both my Lauren said this that it's her out of her subject area, completely out of my subject area as well. But it was wonderful to learn about it. So, you know, teach me some more about it. Maybe we can launch a a school visit, you know, a, sub, a new topic for school visits, that would be great. <laughs> but, but I also think just to go back to what was saying about Dundon Castle is that it has got, I mean, those are two amazing pieces that to me, that, that, that's incredibly high quality art that's going into those. It's just that um, in the, I would like to know if there are more pieces like that in Scotland that we could, that could connect it up. Because I think that it would be lovely if people could do that. It was just a joke when I said about the medieval art spotter's guide, but I think that would be an amazing because I'd certainly want to follow a trail to see all different things. I just things. wonder how much, if any, is at Hawkins as well? Well, yes, indeed. Because at Hawkins House, for people who are watching tonight that don't know, um, Hawkins House was built just not too far away. Was that about 1580s, wasn't it? Yeah, about 1580. Yeah. And they think that a lot of the stone to build it, more than than we probably even know, was, was stolen from the Dundonald Castle to put in it. And they could have taken more sculptures. And because I can't imagine there'd only have been two in a, in a room that size. It was quite a decadent thing to do because that would have been very expensive to have got made. All these sculptures would have been incredibly expensive. So. Wonder. I don't know how much would have survived, but no. Interesting. Maybe one day. Are there any other questions? We have a couple more people. So, you know, Lauren said thank you. Liz said um, thank you again. It's very interesting. She really enjoyed it, especially seeing the medieval references and later artworks. Uh, is there anyone else? We've only got a couple of minutes left, but is there anyone else that wanted to ask any questions of Gwen before we wrap up? In which case, uh, I will just sort of say thank you so much again, Gwen, that was amazing. I learned so much. It was really interesting. Um, and I will say that we have another talk that is coming up on the 12th of August. So same place, same time. It's Thursday night, 7 p.m. Uh, and it is David Harkin. He is a climate change scientist with Historic Environment Scotland. And he is going to be talking about how um, uh, the heritage sector in Scotland is dealing with and reacting to climate change. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, so if you are free, please come along to that. We'll be advertising that very soon. And again, all of our talks are recorded and you can go to, you can view those online if you are a member of the Friends of Dundonald Castle. If you're not a member, please consider signing up. It's well worth it. And you can do that on our website under, I think it's the membership tab. So have a look. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming along tonight. Thank you again, Gwen. That was amazing. I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's good. <laughs> and that's us. You're cool. Thanks.